So I'm here with Terry Fallis, uh, the author of The Best Laid Plans, which has just been shortlisted for the Leacock uh, Medal. Terry, thanks for joining me. Pleasure. Happy to be here, Joe, as always. So I remember uh, the day when uh, you came in with this big stack of paper and said, it's done. And I said, what's done? And you said, my novel. <laughs> and I'd had no real indication that there was a novel in the works uh, before then. Um, how did you manage to keep up your job, uh, keep up your family life, do all the things that you do, and write a novel? Well, I found that if I spent the mornings in the office writing the novel, that worked out very well for me. No, just kidding. Um, I'm, I need a lot of time uh, to write, so uh, writing for me had to be on the weekends and in the evenings, because I'm not one of those who could write with a 15-minute time slot and just write a few paragraphs. I need to get set up. and uh, So it really just required, I guess, some discipline, uh, writing in the evenings, Early Saturday mornings, early Sunday mornings were big times for me. Flights uh, and the occasional business trip when I had a, a free evening, I would I would write. Uh, so it's just something I wanted to do. Once I had it all outlined, uh, which I did in advance, I'm sort of a I need that methodological approach to it. Uh, it's probably the engineer in me. Uh, the writing of it was not as daunting as it uh, as it may appear. Uh, because it was all laid out, I just really had to write it. It took about 10 months of evenings and weekends to, to write it. Now, as someone who read the novel, I kept on looking at it as I was chuckling away and said, that's Terry. This is autobiographical in some ways. Um, do people tell you that sometimes, those that know you, that uh, you are um, there are elements of you in the protagonist? Uh, yes. Uh, I suppose it's, it's common for first-time novelists to extract from their own experiences, and that's clearly what I did. Uh, but I think any attributes that I may bring to the story could be found in, in both of the sort of the lead characters, the narrator and the, uh, the accidental MP in the story. Uh, I kind of split myself apart in a way, uh, and some of the traits portrayed in, in some of the characters are aspirational for me, <laughs> but you know, you're right the person you might want to be, even though you may not be able to get there. But, uh, so there is, it was almost unavoidable. There is some autobiographical content, but probably not as much as people might think. And for anybody who knows you, it's not surprising that when you reference the two characters that have uh, elements of you, they're both essentially positive uh, characters um, and uh, and quite virtuous and uh, uh, idealistic in their approach to things. Yeah, I, I'm not. I probably wouldn't be capable of writing sort of a dark a dark novel. Uh, I think anything I, I ever would write in the creative sense is likely to be. Uh, positive <laughs> and uh, perhaps amusing but uh, yeah I have a difficulty with uh, dark dark content so it's pretty it's pretty straight up. Now Terry as a first-time novelist uh, you wrote your novel I think you took it to a few uh, publishing houses the traditional route and then uh, you got it out there using social media what did you do in order to find your readership? Well, it's very difficult for first-time novelists in this country, uh, in the last 10 years in particular, to break into the mainstream publishing houses. Uh, they have slush piles uh, 10 feet high in their offices that are daily added to by aspiring writers. Uh, and I, of course, thought, well, maybe I'll be able to break through, and I submitted my manuscript. I tried to find an agent. I was able to do neither of those things. Uh, I think writing about Canadian politics uh, may not have been the best choice if I was searching for commercial success. Uh, but, so I thought, you know, rather than bang my head against the, that locked door, I would just try and build an audience uh, on my own. Uh, so I podcast the novel, I put the whole thing out there for free in 20 episodes, one chapter at a time, uh, and just as a sort of a grand experiment in social media to see what would happen. And much to my delight and surprise, uh, people started listening and sending in comments and asking for more and berating me when I missed a week and had to, and, uh, had to delay posting it for one reason or another. Uh, so that was very encouraging for me and very gratifying. And you used your, your terryfollis.com blog, I think, as well. To yes, I, host I, that's right. I, I hosted the podcast on a, on a blog, terryfollis.com, 
And uh, when I finished the podcast, I wondered, well, what am I going to do now with the blog? Because uh, it's just sitting there with 20 podcast episodes on, and I decided to sort of to sustain it as a as a more traditional blog. And I've been blogging, you know, once or twice a week, not not that often, about my publishing experience. So I keep people up to date on on uh, you know when I've found my way into a different bookstore or when something happened. And uh, I think both my readers have really enjoyed it. So. In my recollection is that through the podcast and the blog, you created a bit of a community ar around the novel, and that led to some people actually getting involved with pictures. Yeah, it was very interesting. Uh, and again, it's nothing that, that I really did. I put the novel up there, and then the community gathered around it and, and did its work, which was very rewarding and fulfilling. Uh, yeah, a couple of things happened. Uh, Podiobooks.com, the leading patio book uh, site on the internet, asked if they could have it on their site, and I said, of course. So I have a, a whole set of listeners from the patio book site. Um, it actually was aired on European satellite radio uh, in November in a prime time evening slot on the English language network of Radio Ropa. And you know, that was just someone emailed me and said, could they do that? And I said, sure. Uh, all, and a couple of people, John Hole in particular in Melbourne, Australia, uh, who really seemed to enjoy the novel, decided he'd start this little photo idea where he, he, he encouraged readers to take a photo of the novel in, whatever, in front of whatever landmark they happened to be in. And, uh, and so there are pictures on the Facebook site now for, of the best laid plans being held up in front of Mount Fuji. Uh, in a Hanoi market in Melbourne, in Ottawa, in Kingston, in Boston, in Dallas, and, and several other locales, uh, which is just kind of surreal for me to, to look in, at those pictures and to see my book uh, all around the world, because uh, I kind of expected it only to be of interest to those living in Canada, but uh, it appears that it's had a bit of a broader uh, appeal as well, which is uh, gratifying. And traditional bookstores and some chains started to stock it once you'd done this promotion? Yes, well, when you, when you self-publish uh, a novel, you are your own marketing director and your own book publicist. So uh, the bookstores that are carrying it generally are carrying it because I walked in and said, would you like to carry this book? And uh, I only had one bookstore say no. Uh, so there are probably a dozen or so bookstores in and around Toronto and Ottawa that are, are carrying the book. Uh, and that that may change uh, in the future, but uh, I'm quite happy to be available widespread online and in a few bookstores right now. And being that I'm sitting on a box of books right now, <laughs> anyone can just go to terryfollis.com and, right. and get in touch with you and, and get it, which I'd recommend because it was a great read. Now, um, have the movie offers started to pour in? Uh, no, uh, not yet, but uh, Hope Springs Eternal. Uh, but it was a shock to uh, get the shortlist for the Leacock Medal. It was not something I was expecting given the, the heavyweights that were on the list. And that has actually helped already in the week or so since that happened. I've managed to uh, secure an agent. And uh, the agent is hard at work. And the novel's now in front of four or five uh, publishers. And uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, I should know something by the end of uh, the month on that, whether it'll be picked up. Well, that'd be great. And and you mentioned heavyweights. You're on a short list with Douglas Copeland, Will Ferguson, a couple people who've been there before. Yeah, very, very, uh, very good Canadian, respected, renowned uh, writers. Great and, company to be in. Yeah, uh, I keep expecting Rod Serling to come upon the scene and uh, tell me that this is all in my head or something. But uh, yeah, it's a uh, it's pretty strange, uh, but it's uh, wonderful. So will there be another manuscript appearing in about nine months? Well, I don't know when it's going to happen. I do have uh, a sequel kind of on the drawing board. I haven't started writing yet, but I've started to outline the major sort of events in the plot. Uh, I don't know if that'll be the next one or not. Uh, I hope it will. My agent is thinking a sequel may not be such a hot idea. so. <laughs> I have to, if I'm getting good advice from an agent, I should perhaps listen to them, but uh, so we'll see. Of course, if you could take your Canadian political aid and move him to Washington, that might be a good sequel. There you go, Throw ambassador in the United States, that would be good. <laughs> good Terry, <idea. laughs> thanks very much. Thanks, Joe. Thanks.